Thank you. Buongiorno. So we start out with one question. What's a nice God like you doing in a place like this? To be answered by another question, which is, doesn't it seem a little surprising to you that the Catholic Church, with its long tradition of martyrs who died to not worship pagan idols, owns one of the most impressive, most impressive collections of pagan deities in the world. I mean, it is something of a paradox. The Vatican Museums, with its five million visitors a day, it has three and a half miles of collections, hundreds of thousands of works, and a great many of them are naked remnants of a, of a hostile era. I, hmm. And so, we forget, though, sometimes that the papacy inherited the city. It inherited a ruined Rome, a Rome that had collapsed under its, under its great ambitions. At the fall of the empire, the colossal monuments that the emperors had built had all been destroyed, and they lay submerged underneath the, the, the cow pasture that had once been the forum, or the goats grazing on the Palatine. And it took the Renaissance popes in particular Sixtus IV, to decide that it was time to resurrect that past. And in 1471, Pope Sixtus IV took five bronze statues from antiquity which had been protected and guarded at St. John Lateran for centuries, and he gave them to the city of Rome, opening the world's first public museum. <laughs> you, you just heard me correctly. The popes opened the world's first public museum. So what was Sixtus' dream? What was the big plan here? His thought was art, beauty, and pride in the past would be able to help the Romans to help Rome be reborn. And by that, I mean Renaissance, that Rome would be reborn into a city that was even greater than its pagan progenitor. And what did he use as his image? What was going to be the great new logo? The famous Capitoline she -Wolf. It was Sixtus who donated this ancient statue of the she-wolf who saved Romulus and Remus so they could found the city of Rome. And it was Sixtus who commissioned the two statues of the little, the little twins underneath it. And the image he gave to Rome was new. It would be a story of how compassion could overcome instinct. The very first role of art in Renaissance Rome was how art can promote goodness. It can promote magnanimity. Now, Sixtus had a cardinal nephew named Julius, and Julius spent 20 years collecting art as a cardinal nephew before he was finally, finally elected pope in 1503 as Pope Julius II. And Julius II made a historical decision that year. Instead of handing over a really fabulous personal collection to members of his family, as the Farneses and the Medicis often did, he decided to give that collection to the Vatican. And so it was he who founded the Vatican Museums in 1506. That is incredibly forward thinking. The rest of Europe is going to take 100 years or so to catch up with that one. And so Julius, I have to admit, Julius did put a big sign on his front door. It read, Procul este profani. Those of you who are uninitiated, stay away. And you have to kind of figure that if your average, your average religious pilgrim in 1500 probably balk at the sight of you know naked deities gallivanting in the Pope's garden. So it probably makes sense that he wanted to keep it to an elect few, but in the eyes of Michelangelo, Raphael, those trained, informed, formed eyes, those idols, they became inspiration. And those works of art would become a great model for a new type of Christian beauty. There is one work that sums up the success of Julius's museum, and it is known as the Laocoon. It is a work that was written up in the first century AD. It was famous in antiquity. Pliny the Elder described it, and I quote, as surpassing anything done in painting or sculpture up to this point. It was rediscovered by Michelangelo before his very eyes in 1506, and then Julius II purchased it, showing pretty good taste, given the fact he didn't have art critics to guide him, to guide him back then, and he put it in the Vatican museums where it became the cornerstone of the collection. And that piece, already famous in antiquity, was given a new life. And I'm going to quote Pope Emeritus Benedict the 16th here. I do sort of feel that you should not misquote a pope when you're standing across the street from the Vatican, the bad things might happen. So Pope Emeritus 16, Benedict the 16th told us, 
that the Laocoon in fact acquires its fullest and most authentic light in the Vatican context, in the light of the human preacher shaped by God, of freedom and the drama and his redemption that extends between heaven and earth and flesh and spirit. It is the light of a beauty that shines out from within a work of art and it opens the mind to the sublime. This work opened Michelangelo's mind so much that Michelangelo used it as the opening scene of the Sistine Chapel ceiling, turning it into the God separating light from dark. Think about, the, think about this transformation. We go from the image of a dying pagan to the image of the creation of all existence. That is what Renaissance is all about. 330 years before Dostoevsky would write, Beauty Would Save the World, we have the popes already thinking about it. So, the years pass and the museums transform and museums begin to take on a new identity in 1700. And it's not just a, a space of inspiration and beauty, a locus for the muses, as the origin of the word suggests. They become places of memory places of identity, places to remember, collect, and cherish past cultures. And so the Vatican museums evolved again. And they evolved, in a, they, they evolved again inspired by a culture that in many ways would have seemed hostile to it. It's the, the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment leaders were just as inspired by the rediscovery of Pompeii as Christendom was by the refinding of Laocoon. They rushed to Rome, really fascinated with these papal collections, but their idea of looking at the papal works, they wanted to hold up these great statues in the papal collections to become symbols of their new secularized culture. These would be these would be the poster children of these new republics that would be based on the models of ancient Rome. And there was very little space for religion in their new world picture. But Pope Pius VI at the time, what did he do? Was he scared? No. Did he put a big padlock on the door with a little sign saying, sorry guys, gotta find yourself another sandbox? No. He, bought him, he got himself a curator, he got himself an architect, and he redesigned the Vatican Museums one more time to turn it into something that would face the future, and it was a museum of incredible innovations. It was a museum that, A, it wasn't for the initiated anymore. It was a museum that you see drawings of men, women, children passing through, the, passing through its galleries, people from all over the world visiting its treasures. Then, number two, it was funded by the lottery. He went out and found funding by instituting a lottery in the Papal States, which is something that, by the way, in Italy we still do today to conserve art. And thirdly, it came up with a brand new plan with how to design a museum so that when you put an athlete, you put an athlete statues in a bath complex, you put God statues in a pantheon. The idea of putting a work of art in a plausible original setting, born at the Vatican. But one more truly great innovation, the most brilliant innovation of all, was the purpose of this new museum. It was to invite universal dialogue. This is my favorite picture of the Vatican Museums because it is Pope Pius VI. He is the sovereign leader of the Catholic Church. Uh, he's acting as tour guide to King Gustav III of Sweden. So we've heard of Pope scientists, we've heard of Pope teachers, but did you know we had a Pope tour guide on top of everything else? And the fact of the matter, that was a touchy meeting these two were having. They can't talk about religion because Gustav is the head of the Swedish Protestant Church, and they can't really talk about politics. After all, Gustav is a Freemason. So what are they going to talk about? They can talk about the beauty of man's achievements. They can find mutual accord talking about the great expressions of humanity. That platform of dialogue, to quote Benedict XVI, still exists today in the Vatican Museums. We see it every single day as people from different cultures, backgrounds, social situations, creeds, they all stand side by side looking at those exceptional works of art. And I have another quote of Benedict XVI here who tells us a little bit about what dialogue means. And he tells us that dialogue is possible only on the foundation of clear identity. One can and one must be open, but only when one has something to say and has acquired one's own identity. And so, Pius VI fledgling museum was so confident in its own identity that it opened, it greeted visitors then, and if you're paying attention, you can still see today it greets visitors with a provocation. 
as you walked up the barrel vaulted staircase into the Vatican Museums, your very first view as you walk into the Pio Clementine collection is a room that is designed after the Pantheon, okay? Temple to all the gods. And inside that pantheon, you have a whole bunch of pagan god statues. There's Jupiter, there's Juno, there's Julius Caesar, who in case you missed it, he became a god together with Claudius. And by the way, when you become a god, you do have the good fortune of getting these rather extraordinary body lifts. You look much better as a god in the pagan world. Um, the, um, the, the, the center bowl there, that beautiful piece of porphyry, was quarried in the first century AD by the emperor Nero, transported to Rome, hollowed out to serve as a bath in one of the halls of Nero's golden house. Now, let's just stop and think about this. We are greeted in the museums with pagan idols uh, in a pagan temple lolling around the bowl that belonged to the man who killed St. Peter. He killed St. Paul. Oh, and he killed a couple other hundred Christians while he was at it. Next door. This is collective amnesia here, people. Far from it. That museum, that room, adjoins into a room dedicated to the Greek cross. The Greek cross is early Christian church building par excellence. It, it symbolizes, indeed, the cross of Christ. And in the arms of this Greek cross, there are two giant porphyry sarcophagi. And these sarcophagi that lead, so you see the bronze doors, the, the bowl and the sarcophagi, they lead into this, they lead from this temple. These two sarcophagi, um, they were the burial places of women who were empresses. It has to be because of that stone. But those women, they weren't merely empresses, they were also saints. One contained the remains of Saint Helena, mother of Constantine, the woman who nagged Constantine into tolerating Christians. And this year we celebrate the 1700th anniversary of Constantine's legalization of Christianity. And then there's Saint Costanza, the daughter of Constantine, whose clamorous conversion, it changed it, it, it heralded the transformation of the Roman Empire. So what is the great epic tale of the, of the, of the Vatican Museums? The Vatican Museums tells an amazing story. It's about how Rome became the eternal city. Years ago, when the poet Tibullus wrote of, wrote of the Rome without end at the dawn of the empire to flatter the Caesars as they began the adventure of imperial Rome, he was referring to a city, the city that would be built up, that started as brick and ended as marble in the hands of Augustus. That pagan city then turned around and spent 300 years trying to eradicate Christianity. They destroyed its heroes, they destroyed its homes, they tried to destroy its history. And yet, at the end of the fourth century, those pagans, those persecutors, they became Christian. And those works of art, those artifacts, those dusty vestiges of a collapsed culture, they had a new chance. The marbles of the Vatican would shine again, they would proclaim a far greater and far more lasting glory, that of Christ. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs>